So first, cell phone I had was in 2003 when I graduated from high school because bef like back in those days, like you didn't need to even contact anyone in high school. Like, and it was that like Nokia brick, like you know the one that is usually just found in Africa now and other places like that. that like if you need to like chalk your tire or something, it's perfect for it. Like it is indestructible. And uh, I could not text or say I could not. I don't think texting existed at that point. I don't know. It did. I don't know. I'm pretty ancient. I drive a minivan. I mean, so. Yeah, well I didn't send my first text message until 2007. I graduated from college and my college roommate was like, hey, you can do this. I'm like, you do what? You're like, and I've just, it's gone out there to the internet and sent it to the next person? I, uh, but that phone, the only thing that was awesome about it was I could play Snake on it. You know that game where a little snake, yeah. You know, so that was, I mean, yeah, I can't even get that on the iPhone. But there's nothing remarkable about that phone. Like now that like, people are like, there's a thing where like, oh, did you get the new iPhone? Did you get this? Like then it was like, you have a phone, it, like, oh, I haven't charged this in a week and it still has power, like, just amazing things, the, 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 the leaps we've taken, right? But, but the thing is, is like, when we have something we're like really proud of, when we have something we're like, man, this is fantastic, like, you tell people about it. Like, I was not telling anyone about my Nokia brick, even at that time when it was like space age technology, right? But now it's like, hey, like, did you get the new iPhone? No, like, I got this one six months ago. Oh, that's outdated. It's obsolete. Like now the new one's out. Like, and but everything they can do is just so mind mind blowing to a certain um, extent that like it's like hey we talk about it. Like no one was talking about hey I, I got Frogger on here or I have Snake Game or something. Like it just it was not that great. It was useful. It served a purpose, right? But it was not kind of the, what is the be all and end all now of things. And so. Um, we're going to be talking about this morning the thought and the, that kind of concept or idea of we share what we think is good. We share what we think is like world changing to people, right? You have a whole business model, the company Five Guys Burgers and Fries, right? They do zero advertising and they bank on their product being so good that people are just going to want to tell other people about it. Right? There, there, there's no fancy ads, there's nothing big, but it's what we have is so good that you're going to tell your friends and neighbors and we don't have to spend a dime on it, right? And so we're going to look at what does that look like in the Bride of Christ as, as the church. We have something amazing, but do we really say anything about it? And so we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 1 starting and then we'll hit verse, ch chapter 6 and then um, chapter 10. So so this like, question that we want to look, we want to look at is as as the church, what is that good thing we have, and how and how do we tell people about it? What is it like? What does it look like to do? So Hebrews one verses one through three says this: Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in those late days, or, I'm sorry, in those last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of Majesty on high. Right, and so. We have God's word revealed to us. So, so this like story of what God is doing in the world, we have God's revelation to us, his special revelation to us, to us is his word. Of him saying, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what the whole thing is going to. And we see, right, that he talked about the prophets, that there's a Messiah coming, and like that Jesus is that one, and he is here by a son who he has appointed the heir of all things through whom he created the world. It's this grand plan of like, hey, you, you know this, and he's talking to a group of people who have grown up hearing about this, right? These are Hebrew people, Jewish people, and they know these stories of the prophets. They, they, they know from Moses and they know the way that God is saying things are going to go and telling of this Messiah that was coming. And so they are aware of this and they know, hey, there's a good thing that's coming. There's a lot of stuff that's coming, right? God is, and they also know from the scriptures, right? God 
they, they can see and know the character of God and what he says about himself, right? And we're not going to dig into all of those things because it take way too much time, but we can see throughout like scriptures, God is all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present, sovereign. He's eternal. He's un, unchanging and thousands of more things that he is. And they are able to see from God's word the character and the characteristics of God, right? And those are good, right? But it's kind of like the Nokia brick of it. Like, hey, this is great, and God is good, and there's certain things, but like, it, it, it pales in comparison to the better thing. And what we're going to see here is Jesus is what all that is pointing to. Jesus is what is that, is what that is leading to, and he is that better thing that's like, hey, it is good to hear about it and to know about it, and God is good, and he's going to do something. And then we get to Jesus, and like, this is what God was talking about. This is the best, better thing that we should be able to say, hey, do you know about this? This is good, right? Because the Old, the old Testament gives us a, a, a peak, but Jesus is the full revelation of God. It is the full, hey, God is saying, hey, this is happening, this is happening, and then Jesus is, I am that. I am God with you. Right? And so, Right, there's that whole kind of, okay, we're moving in that, in that sort of like direction, okay, that, that we know from God's word, but we know that Jesus is what it's pointing to. Then we flip ahead to Hebrews chapter 8. I think I said 6. I was totally wrong in that, right? Hebrews 8, verses 1 through 6, right, says this. It says, now the point in which we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he met, as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises right so again, there's a lot there but just the overhead view right so the old testament is pointing to hey there's a savior that is coming there's a messiah that is coming that the world is broken and it will one day be fixed for good and we have a cycle that you see throughout like all of god's word of man fails because of sin there's judgment, there's restoration, and then man falls again. And it continual throughout the story of the Bible until you get to Jesus. Because every fix is almost a, a like temporary fix, if you will, because it's all pointing to one day there's a permanent fix, and that's Jesus. And so the sacrificial um, system that they had was basically, hey, Here's the system that we're using for these temporary fixes. You have sin, there is a sacrifice that has to be made. There is there's wrongs that are done. There's wrongs that you do that you have done as people, there's wrongs that you've done as a nation. And so there are certain sacrifices that if say that I don't know, Brady steals his neighbor's goat. There's a sacrifice that must be made for that. Come on, Brady. All right. So Brady has to make a sacrifice for that offense. But there's also, hey, we as a group, I don't know, did something horrible and awful. All right. There's a sacrifice that must be made for the group of people. Okay. And so there's different levels of that, but they're all not something that's a, it fixes it and it's good. It's kind of like putting duct tape on your car that's falling apart. It'll get you home, but it needs to be addressed again. Right? And so that is what the sacrificial, that, again, that's boiled down really low to it. Basically, hey, the sacrificial system is a continual thing that they had to participate in because they did not have this final permanent fix to their problem. And so when we read about this, uh, hey, Jesus is a high priest, we need to see that the high priest was the one who kind of made sure the sacrifices were, were like correct, but he's also the one that made the sacrifice for the people group. And so he is, he is the one who was a flawed human being that was chosen by, by God to be this high priest. Right? So he's a human just like you and I. He has mistakes. He has sinned. And it was such a big deal that this guy only went into the presence of God once a year. 
And even when they did that, he went through this whole j j ceremony of being made clean and washing and whatnot and repenting of his sins and sacrifices he had to do before he could go, even go into the presence of God. And even when he did that, they'd said, hey, we're going to tie this rope around you just in case God smites you. And then we can drag you out, right? And so no one else says, just get killed to get your body out, right? So it was a big deal saying, hey, like, you are the guy that goes for us, but you're not even perfect. And you could, you're just as flawed as us. And so when they are talking about this and they're calling Jesus this high priest, they're saying, hey, you are the one that goes before God for us. But you're better. We don't have to tie a rope around your waist. We don't have to clean you up. You are clean. You are perfect. You're the only one that is worthy to be in the presence of God and you are going in there for us. It's a better thing. It is so, so much better to have a permanent fix, right? There's only so long that you can put duct tape on your car to keep it from falling apart before you say, you know what, I need to go to the mechanic and I need to get this fixed, fixed. And Jesus is that, hey, stop with the duct tape. He will fix it once and for all. Right? He's a better high priest. He has a better covenant. Right? It's permanent, better promises. Everything about him is better than the old way. Because he is the, the fulfillment of that. Everything that has been talked about is pointing to him and what he would do. And what does that look like? Flip ahead to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. It says this. It says, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Right? It is a permanent fix. And like, there's a, like, this passage is kind of a, have you ever seen, like, in a movie where the guy's walking away with an explosion that's behind him and doesn't flinch, just kind of a baller move? That's what this is, right? It's kind of that, it is done, it's, I don't have to worry about it. There's this picture of, like, hey, the, the uh, priests that you are, like, used to, they work. They're always walking around, they're on their feet and doing stuff. Jesus did it, sat down, and now he's just watching. And he's waiting for his enemies to, to become his footstool because it is done, it is finished, it is permanently fixed. There's nothing more that needs to be done. It is a picture of, hey, this is not a temporary, this is, this is done for good. The priests stand, Jesus sits. The priests are constantly working. Jesus does one thing and it is over. It is finished, it is complete. Jesus' work is better. Jesus is more than just a better high priest. He's a better everything, which allows you and I to, as people who he has gone before the Father for, and we are with him, we're not going through that system of, man, I've got to make myself right. I've got to do this. Jesus has done it. And the relationship we can have with the God of the universe is restored through him. That's worth telling someone about. That's worth the proclaiming from the mountaintops. Right? There's, there's a great thing that sums up this idea of like Jesus is better than everything in the Old, the old Testament is pointing to him, this better thing that is coming. And rather than me try to explain it to you, we're just going to show you a video of a very smart man called Tim Keller just explaining it. So here is this video. Take a look. is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative in which every story, every character points beyond itself to one who is greater. The story of Adam and Eve is not just about the first man and woman. There is a true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is ascribed to us. 
There is a true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. There is a true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go out into the void to create a new people of God. There is a true and better Isaac, the son of laughter, of grace, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all. There is a true and better Jacob, who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserve, so we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. There is a true and better Joseph, who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save them. There is a true and better Moses who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. There is a true and better rock of Moses who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. There is a true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer who then intercedes for and saves his foolish friends. There is a true and better David whose victory becomes his people's victory though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. There is a true and better Esther who didn't just risk losing an earthly power but lost the ultimate heavenly one who didn't just risk his life but gave his life to save his people. There is a true and better Jonah who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. There is a true and better Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain so the angel of death will pass over us. He's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb the true light and the true bread. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative that points to one person, Jesus. So everything is pointing to him, right? And that was not Tim Keller. It was his words, but they got a guy who does not sound like my grandpa to do it. So, but Tim Keller is an awesome guy. He'd be a great guy to have as a grandpa if you ever want one. So, but, right, everything in the Old Testament is pointing to this. And the only way that it doesn't fall short, right? Have you ever, like, built something up so well, or so much, and then it falls short because it's just not that great? The movie Napoleon Dynamite was that for me. I hear about it so much, like, I was away at school, didn't, like, have a car so I couldn't drive to the theater and I like, hear people talking about like, Man, this movie is so great, so great and I finally see it and I'm like, hell, oh. that was a waste of an hour and a half, right? But Jesus is not that, right? And you have all of time is pointing to him. Everything is pointing to him. Everything is pointing to him is the answer and somehow even our pointing to him falls short of how good he is. And so what that tells us as followers of Christ, right, is that the, that, that the redemption that the world has been longing for and groaning for is found in Jesus, permanent, right, not a small fix, but a permanent fix is found in him, and the full redemption of creation is found in him. And so because we know that, and because I hope you have experienced that through a relationship with him on your own, we should be able to not even think about but just we have to tell somebody we as people who have been saved by him who know who he is know what he is about would I mean and you hear it said as kind of a stupid phrase but shout it from the mountaintops and scream about it like hey like we should be as passionate about telling other people about this true and better fix that the world has been longing for that we know it that we've experienced we should be more passionate about that than like hey I got the new iPhone Bacon double cheeseburger at five guys. Life changing, right? Jesus is better than that. And the question is, do we proclaim that? If you've experienced it, how could you not? To have experienced the fix that all of mankind has been longing for since sin entered the world. And as someone who knows Jesus, you've experienced what that's like. Tell someone about it.